stand in reverence for God's word. Hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed our message? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he has took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has gone his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Bow with me. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. And we can see him clearly in this passage as the king crucified before the foundations of the world, before, before he ever stepped foot into this world, Lord. You had it all planned for us. And he was pierced and punished and bruised for us. And God, help us to appreciate this. Help it to strengthen our faith. Help it to let it sink into our hearts so that we know that Jesus is the most important thing in our life and we worship him. In his name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. This is the gospel according to Isaiah. This is the second in a series called, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. And, um, and what we're going to study today is Isaiah 53. You can turn in your Bible, read along with it. You can get the app, and the outline is on the app with all the answers. You can fill in the blank. I hope that you keep these and you study it uh, uh, and use it for future reference, too. But this is the gospel according to Isaiah, and it was written over 700 years before the birth of Christ. It is, I think, the most amazing prophecy in the Old Testament regarding the death and the resurrection of Christ. It is quoted in the New Testament over, over 40 times. I mean, when you read Isaiah 53... Who else could it be talking about other than Jesus? I mean, it points directly to Jesus. And we know that because in the New Testament, when the Ethiopian eunuch was riding back to Africa, um, Philip joined him in the chariot, and he was reading Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself? Or to somebody else. And Philip began at that very scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Oh, it's all about Jesus. And this is the gospel before it ever happened. You can see the death of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection and exaltation in Isaiah 53. You know, it... It is so striking in its details that some people have thought, well, that was just put in later. But we know that is not true because in 1947, uh, there was a little boy throwing rocks into caves near Qumran, and they found found some old scrolls. He heard some pottery break. And one of the scrolls was was, uh, the great scroll of Isaiah. And it was amazing, not only in its accuracy of being copied over the years, but the fact that it was 100 years before the birth of Jesus and God explained the story before it ever happened. And I tell you, I hope that God can do for you what he has done for me in my own personal study because he is, I mean, I've been at the foot of the cross this week. And uh, it begins like this. 
Isaiah speaks of his humble birth and his appearance. Who has believed our message and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The word revealed is a very important word because you don't just figure out who Jesus is yourself. The Holy Spirit has to illuminate your mind. Nobody can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. And so when Peter made the good confession that Jesus was the Christ, Jesus said, you didn't figure that out on your own, and nobody else, you know, told you that. But it was revealed from my Father who is in heaven. Man, that is so important. It transforms evangelism. Because when somebody is dealing with existential questions regarding the meaning of life or guilt or death or life after death, I know probably the Holy Spirit is working on them and drawing them. So I step into the flow of the Holy Spirit right there and then witness to them. And their response is because God is calling them and drawing them closer to Jesus. So to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I want to ask you this morning, has the arm of the Lord been revealed to you? Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God? That he died for your sins? That he rose from the grave? That he is king of kings and lord of lords? It has been given to you. You didn't figure that out on yourself. It has been revealed to you. It's not just information you're processing. It's revelation given by the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He grew up like a tender plant, like a little, listen, like a little tender shoot coming up out of a dry ground. It it wasn't like a great big majestic oak tree, just a little tender shoot. As an infant, and listen, As a fetus, think of that, God becoming a fetus and growing in her belly and then being born a little infant, a tender shoot, and then growing through childhood and learning. And I wonder what it was like as he grew in knowledge and wisdom and stature for him to read Isaiah 53 and realize that's how it's going to happen to me. It is amazing. And notice um, that um, he was like a, a tender root out of a dry ground and that he was common in his appearance. I think this describes the um, physical appearance of Jesus, you know, from childhood through manhood. We all have our ideas about what Jesus looks like. (laughs) I heard Bob Russell tell about this lady who uh, went to their Easter pageant And this guy who played Jesus had long hair, and he was a muscle builder. And this grandma come out and said, wasn't Jesus a hunk? You know, and another guy said, that's the first time I've seen a Jesus that I could follow. Well, I hate to disappoint you. But we all have our ideas about what Jesus looked like. I know what he looked like because I've seen the pictures. We would like to believe that he's strong and handsome and that even his appearance would cause him to stand out in the crowd like the first king of Israel, but we know what happened to him. Or the second king of Israel who was handsome, but we know what happened to him. No, the prophecy seems to indicate that his physical appearance He was just a common, ordinary Jewish man. He had no stately form or splendor in his appearance, and there was nothing about his physical 
uh, features that would make us attracted to him or desire him. He would just fully identified with common people, and I get a lot of encouragement out of that because I'm a pretty common-looking guy. He just became one of us. And Isaiah was warning the people that not to expect the Messiah to come in looking impressive and royal, but just a common man. And then he talks about not only the humbleness of his birth and his uh, life, his physical appearance, but also his suffering. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Isaiah says six things here in this, from verses 3 to 6. First, he was rejected. Notice, it, it was not only rejected, he was despised and rejected. John 1.11 says he came to his own and his own um, did not receive him. He was rejected by his brothers in John uh, 7. For even his own brothers didn't believe in him. He was rejected by two of his disciples, betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, and forsaken by all of them. He was rejected by the leaders of his nation, rejected by the common people in Israel who at one time during the triumphal entry were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now they were saying, no, not Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify him. He was rejected and despised. He was a man familiar with grief and suffering. Why did they do that? Well, they wanted a conqueror, not a carpenter. They wanted a sovereign, strong sovereign, not a servant. And so through the foolishness of what is preached, we are saved. It is only through the cross of Jesus Christ. But here he was pierced, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. All the, all the songs today, I mean, they always do, uh, wove the whole theme of Isaiah 53 all the way through it, didn't it, Matt? He, they pierced his hands and feet with nails. They pierced his side with a spear. The Gospels say that the soldiers took charge of Jesus and he went out carrying his own cross. As the procession moved from the Antonio Castle through the Joppa Gate all the way to um, the place of the skull, they finally, John says, here they crucified him. It's pretty limited language. I mean, it describes the most horrible event in all of history in four words. Here they crucified him. What they did is they put the cross down and they laid Jesus down on it and they stretched one arm out and they put it on the cross and they probably drove the spike through the wrist. A lot of people, a lot of pictures have it through the hand, but in the Greek, the word wrist and hand are the same. And we use it the same way when, some, when a policeman puts you in uh, cuffs, what do we call them? Handcuffs, but they're actually around your wrist well, you know, this part of the hand would not support the dead weight of a body of a man. So they, they stretched his hand out and they drove that nail in. Can you imagine that nail, uh, that hammer glancing off and hitting his hands and his fingers? And then they stretched his other arm out and they drove that spike and they pierced his hands and then they bent and folded the legs and put the feet one on top of each other and then they drove a single spike through both feet into the wood. Can you imagine how many times his feet would cringe as that hammer would blow against that? And then came the worst part of all. 
uh, they lifted up that cross, and the hole had to be deep enough to support the dead weight of a body of a man. And when they would drop that down in that hole, sometimes Josephus said the bodies were just ripped off the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. And he was crushed for our iniquities. The word crushed, the word here is usually talking about somebody who's been crushed on the ground by a burden or an oppressor. We know that Jesus fell under the weight of the cross because of exhaustion, but I think what he's really talking about is the burden, the heavy burden of all of our sin being placed on him was crushing. And he was punished. Jesus endured punishment that we deserved. Exodus 34, I talked about it last week in the sermon where God appeared to Moses and he said, Yahweh, Yahweh, you all remember that lesson? And uh, the great and compassionate God, and here's what he says, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty un." He cannot leave guilt unpunished. Why? It's not just some arbitrary rule. It's who he is in his holy, righteous character. He could not, and, and, and the law is an extension insight into his character. And his justice demands that sin be punished. Listen, when there is injustice in this country and we see it in a trial, there is a great outcry for justice, right? I mean, even as humans, we see that. But God, in his justice, he cannot tolerate sin. And sin had to be punished, so he punished Jesus for our sin. He was wounded, and by his wounds we are healed. We just sang that. By his wounds. By his wounds we are healed. He's talking about the stripes that were put across Jesus' back by a cat of nine tails. When I was in the fourth grade, I used to practice with this whip because I sang this song in the, at the honor banquet. It's called uh, 15 Miles on the Erie Canal. I would sing that, and uh, I had these little cowboy or some kind of suit on and 15 miles on the Erie Canal. I remember that. And then I would, I would use that whip and crack it, you know. And I could crack it good. It had one leather strand that went out like a cowboy uses. That's not what this whip is. The whip that they used on Jesus is called a cat of nine tails. It had a wooden handle or a metal handle and then out of it went not one strand, but many leather strands, at least nine. And embedded in the end of those leather strands were jagged pieces of rock and bone and metal. And they would strap, they would strip you of your clothes, strap you to a pole or over a stump, and then they would beat you with that cat of nine tails, just ripping flesh off of bone. I mean, by the time they got through beating him, his back was like raw cherry red, just meat turned inside out. He was one mass of quivering human flesh. And by his wounds, you were healed. By his stripes, your sin is atoned for. You see, he bore our sin, verse number five. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He, Peter said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Isaiah next talks about his, his atoning sacrifice. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent, 
so he did not open his mouth. Isn't this amazing? This was written 700 some years before Jesus, before it happened. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls 100 years before the incarnation, and yet Jesus fulfills all of this in detail. And he was silent, like a sheep going to slaughter, or like a sheep being sheared. When he stood before Pilate, or when he stood before Herod, I mean, Herod was a joke. He was the, this is Herod Antipas that Jesus stood before. It is the one who was committing adultery with his sister-in-law. This is the guy who murdered John the Baptist because in a drunken stupor. Do you all remember this? His his stepdaughter was dancing seductively before him, and he was drunk, and he promised her anything she wanted. And at her her mother's insistence, uh, she asked for the head of John the Baptist, and she got it. One time... Somebody said, Jesus, do you know Herod's after you? (laughs) Jesus said, you go tell that fox that today and tomorrow I do my work, and on the third day I'll be glorified. So the Lord stood before this adulterous, drunken, cold-hearted man and was judged. Herod was excited he, he, he'd heard about the miracles. He said, do me, do me a miracle, Jesus. Jesus didn't open his mouth. So they had their fun with him in other ways. They blindfolded him and turned him around, and they hit him with their fist, and they would say, hey, prophet, prophesy. Who was it that hit you? And then they would kneel to the ground and, and say, hell, king of the Jews. Jesus' face was swollen and bruised. His hair was matted. He had spittle all over him. It was not only injustice, but it was so cruel, inhumane treatment by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet, who can speak of... uh, Yet... Who of his generation protested? You know how people protest today? You didn't see any of that in the streets of Jerusalem. They were blood hungry. They wanted Jesus crucified. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. He was crucified between two thieves, two rebels. And with the rich in his death, that's Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus sticking down. Yet, notice this, yet it was, verse 10, the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by my knowledge, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquity. I mean, that's Jesus. How could anybody not read that? Anybody not read Isaiah 53? And you see, that's Jesus. That's exactly what he did. And the reasons he had to die is number one, he had to take He had to take our place in suffering the penalty of sin. It's called vicarious atonement. I want you to know that word. Repeat after me. Vicarious atonement. Vicarious atonement. It has its roots in the Old Testament where um, the wages of sin is what? It's death. But God would allow, because he was looking forward to when Jesus would die, an animal to be offered, a lamb, a goat, a bull. And they would spill that blood. And then, so another animal would would die. Somebody would vicariously die. And they looked forward to Jesus until 
he was the Lamb of God. Second, to satisfy the justice of God. To satisfy the righteousness and the holy law. The term for this is propitiation. Now you say, I don't want to learn all these big words. Listen, you need to know these words. Vicarious atonement. I mean, you're taking algebra and you've taken trigonometry, or you've taken calculus, you need to know this. Propitiation, say that, propitiation. You say, what does that mean? It's a sacrifice of atonement. It's, it's a concept in the Old Testament sacrificial system where animals were sacrificed and their blood was applied to the altar. But uh, what happened was the wrath of God was satisfied because the justice of God was executed and the penalty for sin was paid for. Listen, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Listen, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, propitiation through faith in his blood he did it to demonstrate his justice because at the present time, the sins committed beforehand were left unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice so that now God is just and the one who justifies those who believe in Jesus. So God is holy, righteous. His law is holy, righteous. It says that sin has to be punished. So what did he do? God became a human. God kept the law. And then he died on the cross. And God absorbed his own wrath and propitiated. You all get it? His own anger. And the punishment that we were due was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. So law, the God's holy law and God's grace kissed and now we are justified by faith in what God did, not what we did. I mean, it is breathtaking what God did. And he brought us salvation. And the blessings of salvation are peace and healing. By his wounds we are healed. And righteousness, he bestows his own righteousness. He declares us righteous in Jesus Christ, listen, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God made him who knew no sin. Who is that? Jesus. God made him who knew no sin. All the sin of the past, all the sin of the future, wave after wave of sin come, crushing Jesus. And God turned the lights out. People had their fun with him from 9 o'clock in the morning till 12 noon. But at the apex, when the sun was at its brightest, God turned out the lights. What do you think those people thought when that happened? They knew God was doing something. And they didn't have any flashlights or iPhone flashlights. Everything was dark. And darkness, and not only light, but darkness is associated with God. God appears sometimes in thick darkness. And at that time, Jesus hanging on the cross, God made him a sacrifice of atonement poured out his wrath on Jesus and satisfied his justice. God now is just because sin was punished. You all get it? And now he can justify those who have faith in Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing about the gospel. Until God is satisfied, you cannot be justified. Repeat after me. Until God is satisfied, you cannot be justified. Yeah. 
He had to satisfy his own justice. Now he is just. And the one who justifies, declares righteous those who have faith in Jesus. And then finally, you see the resurrection in Isaiah. Though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring. All of you are his offspring. And prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and divide spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now look at this, Isaiah 52, 13. See, my righteous servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. Notice this word, raised That's in the Old Testament. That's 700 years before Jesus stepped on earth. He will be raised and what? Lifted up and highly exalted and given a name that is above every name just as there were many who were appalled at him. Look at this. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. It was terrible. It was just one mass of quivering human flesh hanging on that cross. Listen, just as they were appalled at that, so he will sprinkle many nations, including ours. And kings will shut their mouth. Won't that be a good day? (laughs) Because of him, for what they were not told, they will see him, what they have not heard they will understand. I love Isaiah 53, and it should produce conviction of sin and contrition over sin and conversion to Jesus and confidence, not only in the claims of Christ, listen, confidence that we are saved, confidence that Jesus satisfied. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Father, thank you so much for the prophecy of Isaiah. It it makes us convicted of our sin. And we feel contrition when we look on the one that has been pierced, Jesus. And And it leads to conversion away from sin and towards Jesus so that, as Peter said, we can be dead to sin and live for righteousness. Thank you, God, for the righteousness that you bestow on us through our faith in Jesus Christ alone. And for that, we have, because you did that, you did it all, Lord, we have great confidence and we are secure. In Jesus' name, amen.